you so much for the introduction. Uh, it's been a privilege to uh, learn from and think with uh, you all coming from different disciplinary backgrounds. And I wanted to start by uh, talking about uh, the treatment of non-human animals in China and the uh, types of images that come to mind. On the one hand, uh, unsavory images show the over-harvesting of endangered species and the consumption of creatures rarely considered food elsewhere in the world. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one also thinks of the ubiquity of cat cafes and toy poodles in urban centers in China, which shows that China's middle class is increasingly craving contact with non-humans as companions. To give you uh, an image, here is um, an image uh, of Wuhan as the epidemic um, was spreading throughout China. Uh, the Chinese government relocated the majority of Wuhan residents to quarantine centers and temporary hospitals. And here you have uh, an image of animals who were let out of their apartments to, to essentially fend for themselves. And this was considered uh, you know, preferable uh, as opposed to locking them in departments. The and that also happened um, in, in China during that time. And as the coronavirus spread throughout the world, uh, stereotypical accusations of Chinese as consumers of exo exotic animals began to surface. And the Chinese government led a massive PR effort to uh, damage control and to improve its image. And here is uh, an advertisement showing um, a modification of a well-known Confucian motto that says uh, human animals are friends and should not be eaten. So my paper is part of a book project uh, tentatively titled Before Silent Spring, The Emergence of Ecological Consciousness in China and the West. And more specifically, it comes uh, from a chapter on what I call interspecies contact zones. And this presentation uh, examines briefly the emergence of uh, the awareness of animal labor, welfare, and companionship during the Republican period before the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. Non-human labor remains a subject of contention in contemporary analyses of human productive act activities. As a number of theorists have pointed out, non-humans have been variously conceptualized as raw materials, instruments of production, living factories, means of the economy of signs, and metaphorical others to human freedom and agency. The environmental historian J.R. McNeil has used the framework of the somatic energy regime to conceptualize organisms as converters and storage devices of the sun's energy. And originally conceived as providers of dra draft power, non-humans take on further roles, uh, more complex roles, by participating in activities such as hunting, herding, or warfare, and law, enforce law enforcement. And building on McNeil's framework and Chinese conceptions of energy, Michael Muscolino, for example, has argued that the militarization of draft animals during World War II in Asia can be explained in part by the broader violent competition for energy resources between Chinese and Japanese militaries. So another way to think of non-human animals um, as laborers is to conceive of them as bare life. For example, uh, Temple Grandin, Steve Triffler, and Alex Benchette uh, have discussed uh, the, the slaughter plant as a site of analysis um, in their research on industrial food production in the US. In modern Chinese studies, Sigrid Schmelzer, for example, has written an informative case study on hog farming in China from the late 1920s to the late, late 1930s. And David Sneef and D. Mac Williams, for example, have analyzed the intensification of animal husbandry in Inner Mongolia uh, in the post-1949 period. And finally, non-human animals as companions. Um, so several uh, classic works in this uh, domain uh, include Yifu Tuan's Dominance and Infection, uh, Donna Haraway's When Species Meet, uh, and also Eduardo Cohn, uh, How Forts Think, in which he uh, argues for an anthropology beyond the human, a method that he uses to analyze how 
indigenous, indigenous groups in the Amazon uh, communicate with their canine companions through words, sounds, and even dreams. However, the affective labor of non-humans remains, remains under-theorized, I argue, in part because scholars are faced with the challenges of representing non-human connection and interiority. So while contemporary theorists generally accept the premise of non-human labor, how should we theorize its affective dimension more substantively? So my discussion of non-human affective labor does not cover the familiar ground of how non-humans make humans feel. I also avoid speculative claims on non-human interiority or inten intentionality proper. Rather, uh, I want to focus on what non-humans would have to do or must have been capable of doing in order to perform labor in human society. So in other words, I'm looking at the condition of possibility for non-human affective labor and essentially bracketing the issues of non-human cognition and inten intentionality that other uh, scholars and scientists have uh, addressed. So in, other, so in short, non-humans must have developed internal mechanisms to check the affects and modify their behaviors in their interactions with humans. So I draw on Arlie Hochschild's work on emotional labor, um, which I find to be especially relevant in the discourse of, act, uh, in, in discourse of affect. There, there's a number of theorists who work on uh, affect theory, um, but I, I'm going to focus on this one for, for today's presentation. So um, she brings up this concept called feeling rules, which are standards used in emotional conversation to determine what is rightly owed and owing in the currency of feeling. And basically, it talks about the transactions that are um, measured in terms of uh, emotions. While Hochstra's framework is not intended to be applicable to non-humans, existing analyses of non-human labor suggest that non-human and human interactions are guided by latent rules. Uh, for example, as Yifu Tuan observes in the uh, work I mentioned earlier, pets such as dogs learn to submit and cooperate in human households. Their affective labor consists of displaying context-dependent uh, emotions and behaviors and checking the instincts and affects portraying by humans. For example, guard dogs learn to display a welcoming gesture to friends and an aggressive one to foes. Uh, retrievers control their appetite and uh, impulses when they fetch game for hunters. And emotional support animals, uh, including guide dogs, restrain a wide spectrum of impulses in order to enter human spaces not designed to include humans, non-humans, I mean. So I, in other words, I argue that humans and non-humans, though unequal partners in their in, inter interactions, do construct a shared uh, social logic. So bringing in uh, archival work here, in 2018, 2019, I received the Fulbright grant to conduct research at the number two historical archive in Nanjing, China, uh, which is the national repository of Republican era government documents. I examined the Department of Agriculture and Forestry collection, including doc legal documents on the management of large farm animals, such as horses and cattle. And in the longer paper, I presented six vignettes to complicate um, the familiar narratives of non-human animals in, in modern China. And for this presentation, I'll focus on uh, just the, the th first three. From the late 1920s to the early 1940s, the Department of Agriculture and Forestry announced a series of guidelines re regulating the care of farm animals. Here we have an announcement from November 1929 uh, in which the department explains in detail how farm animals should be bred. Here's an example. Uh, section 12 uh, stipulates that the animals need to be superior. Um, they need to be taken to a quiet place with surrounding wall structures and the climate should be relatively cool and without rain. And it goes into further detail. I will let you read about how um, the farmers need to uh, wash the genitals before the animals uh, you know, perform engaging copulation and, um, and the other things that you will need to do um, to take care of the animal. 
so a couple of uh, points here. Here's an, ex what, here's an example or early example of what I consider the standardization of human care towards non-human animals in modern China. However, the existence of regulations also suggests that the actual behaviors were probably uneven. At the same time, it displays relative autonomy of non-humans uh, in, in mating in the surface of human protective activities. Another uh, section uh, of the guidelines uh, shows that uh, that tone capacity uh, you know, should not exceed half of the animal's body weight. So it's fairly explicit and uh, pedagogical. Uh, carrying capacity should not exceed one third of the animal's body weight. However, these regulations are intended for animals in use by the people, uh, uh, which is to say that animals under the military's jurisdiction um, are under a different set of rules, presumably. So here, uh, there's a sense that the state can both regulate and condone the harsh treatment of non-human animals. At the same time, detailed instructions on how to care for non-humans adequately, albeit as chattel, uh, suggest that the emergence of the animal welfare in modern Chinese consciousness. And finally, I wanted to close with uh, this example. This is, um, this is a petition letter uh, written to uh, the executive UN uh, of the ROC government uh, in 1933. Uh, often these letters are, uh, were duplic duplicated by uh, by officials using fountain pens, but this one is written neatly with a brush on folded scroll paper mounted onto a, a board, uh, which suggests that it might be the original letter. And I discovered this letter in the files of the Executive UN, the pres Office of the President. Um, and it describes um, flood survivors in one particular county along the Yellow River. And I, I want you to um, maybe take a look uh, and also pay attention to the description of non-human animals in, in, in the letter. So I'll give you all a moment to read this. One minute remaining. So now the author is talking about the animals. So the letter suggests that non-human, uh, that human attachment to non-human animals uh, in a way that's more than just sources of wealth and food. Um, the shared social logic that I mentioned earlier is put under strain, but not completely abandoned. And if we were to take the description of non-human animals there as just a case of not anthropomorphism, it does not completely acknowledge the complexities of non-human cognition and labor in human society. So in closing, I have three brief initial conclusions. Um, Non-humans perform affective labor by coping with the affect in the service of human protective acti activities. Affect um, is not limited to or contingent upon human bodies. And finally, a relational approach to human on human interactions takes the senses to be an ontological ground without challenging the parallel inquiry into non-human cognition, which I reserve for the scientists and other scholars. Thank you very much.